uh, the language that the Bureau of Land Management uses. So these national conservation areas are really focused on conserving a variety of features. So as a biologist, you know, my, my thought is always going to the plants and animals in an area. But if we read about um, McInnes Canyon NCA, uh, the areas making up Black Ridge, Ruby Canyons of the Grand Valley and Rabbit Valley, which contain unique and valuable scenic, recreational, multiple use opportunities, paleontological, natural, and wildlife components are worthy of additional protection as a national conservation area. So kind of a lot in there, in addition to just the biological components, um, recognizing that these are scenic areas and important recreational areas as well. So in addition to the act creating uh, this NCA, um, this also served to conserve, protect, and enhance for the benefit and enjoyment of present and future generations, the unique and nationally important values of the public lands, including geological, cultural, paleontological, natural, scientific, recreational, environmental, biological, wilderness, wildlife education, and scenic resources. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I have to hand it to the BLM. They, they have their work cut out for them because there's a lot in here, right? There are a lot of different components to these NCAs. Um, trying to balance the, the preservation of all of these things is, is a really big deal and, and a tall order. So um, my goal uh, with this study was to help in terms of understanding the important biological component um, with the idea that a floristic survey uh, would benefit the Bureau of Land Management in their efforts um, to, to do this kind of tall order here. So uh, the McInnes Canyon NCA in particular, um, as Sarah said, this is the uh, 20th anniversary. Um, it was named after um, or, or renamed in 2005 in honor of Congressman Scott McInnes. Uh, it's pretty big. It's 123,000 acres, and um, it is divided up a little bit. Uh, 75,000 of those acres are up on the Black Ridge uh, wilderness area, and so those have uh, different levels of protection and restriction um, versus some of the areas down closer to the river. And like I mentioned earlier, I think this, it's really um, important to realize this is a multi-use area in that, in that language for the um, conservation of this area. They really do focus on both biologic and geologic and paleontological and recreational uses. So um, I'm sure most of us have enjoyed hiking or biking or floating the river uh, through Ruby Horse Thief. And balancing those uses with uh, the, the real locals, like that plants and animals, is, is a tall order and something um, that I think, you know, it, it's going to be a, always be a challenge. Um, but hopefully we can all um, get the most out of this area and, and utilize it fully. So in particular, my question, uh, what kind of drives me as a scientist is understanding biodiversity. Um, really, what, what gets me going is, is this question of what's out there, right? Um, when I moved to Colorado, uh, you know, learning the plants was one of the first things I started to do uh, when I moved out here. And in particular, in a large area like McInnes Canyon National Conservation Area, you have a lot of territory. There are a lot of different habitats. There's the pinyon juniper woodland. There are riparian areas right along the river. Uh, there are a few seeps where you get some really cool plants. Um, you know, some areas are kind of barren cheatgrass areas. And so um, tying all these together, learning the plants out there, um, and then also understanding their distributions. Um, certainly, if you're looking for cottonwoods, you know to go by the rivers or, or wetter areas. Uh, but distributions of other plant species can be a little trickier to nail down. So answering this question of, of what's out there, uh, this is what really drives me as a scientist and, and keeps me interested. 
understanding biodiversity, I think, has a lot of other useful applications. So by doing a floristic inventory, by figuring out what species occur in this area, we can really benefit organizations like the Bureau of Land Management. So by knowing what's out there, we can help those management entities make informed decisions regarding land use. If we find a, a rare, sensitive, endangered plant species, by um, finding that and, and letting them know where that plant is found, they can change land use, maybe change grazing or, or reroute a trail, things like that. A uh, floristic inventory can also be a really great uh, baseline or, or springboard for other studies. So um, I know my BLM colleagues this year were up on Black Ridge after the fire looking at um, the burned area and thinking about revegetation up there. Uh, if we know the species that occurred up there beforehand, we can again make good um, decisions on, on what plant species uh, to put back in there. Uh, similarly, I've got other, other um, colleagues who study things like um, some of the amphibians that occur in McInnes Canyon. Well, those animals need plants, they need habitat. And so again, a floristic inventory can benefit uh, other scientists. Interestingly, we can use um, our, our plant species list as a reference point to measure change over time. If we start seeing new species coming in, like uh, invasive or weedy species coming in, um, we, can, we can sort of compare that with our known species. Um, with things like climate change, we can track species over time. Uh, maybe their flowering time is becoming earlier and earlier as it gets warmer and warmer. So I, I think this provides a great baseline. In addition to answering that, that question that I think a lot of us are curious about of just what's out there. So uh, back in 2012, uh, I put in a proposal to the BLM to do a floristic inventory. Um, this was actually on their kind of priority list of, of things that they hope to accomplish uh, in McInnes Canyon. So my goal was to create a complete species list um, of all the vascular plant species and one of the things I stressed was uh, making vouchered specimens. So it's one thing for a botanist to go out there and, and say, oh, there's a juniper and there's a pinion. Um, it's another thing to have specimens of those in an herbarium, in a museum where we keep dried plant specimens. Um, I think these specimens are very, very valuable. They serve as data points. They serve as records of what species are growing um, in a given area at a given time. And so throughout this project, we spent a lot of time um, vouchering specimens, making uh, specimens of plant species out in McGinnis Canyon. Some other goals that I really uh, wanted to do with this project was uh, to hire and train undergraduate students. So being a professor at Colorado Mesa, I'm around undergraduates every day. Um, and I thought this would be a great way to get them involved, uh, have them learn different uh, methodologies, connect them with agencies like the Bureau of Land Management. That species list, as I mentioned, um, you know, this is a, a, a deliverable product that I think the BLM will be using uh, to make decisions about the land use and also, as I mentioned, support further research. And then uh, because we have other NCAs, because we have places like the Colorado National Monument, our list of species for McInnes Canyon would serve as a really nice comparison for those other public lands um, that, that I think could, could provide some really interesting uh, understanding of what species are where uh, and why they may be in one place and not another. So that comparison, um, what, what actually one of the things that got me going on this project was finding this, which was um, the annotated checklist of the vascular flora of the Colorado National Monument. So this is a, a, a technical report that was put out back in 2009 that lists all of the plant species that have been collected in the Colorado National Monument. So 
this provided me with uh, you know a general idea of what plants um, I may expect to find in McInnes Canyon. Uh, because the, the monument and McInnes Canyon share a border, they also share similar um, habitats and, and life zones. We may expect these two to be very similar, uh, but that's a nice hypothesis for us to test out. So if we look at the Colorado National Monument, the monument is much, much smaller than McInnes Canyon's. The monument's only about 20,000 acres. Uh, McInnes Canyon, as I mentioned, is 100, 170,000. So right off the bat, we might expect there to be more species in McInnes Canyon. Uh, from the Colorado National Monument, there are 467 vascular species known. Uh, 414 of those are vouchered, so they're actual physical specimens. Others have been recorded from the literature. There are also about 300, close to 300, 296 species that are known to occur in similar habitats but have not been found in the monument. So these um, you may expect to find in the monument, although uh, previous searching has not found them. And then 20 of the species from the monument are species of concern. So kind of right off the bat, this provides us a really nice comparison uh, what are we going to find in McInnes Canyon? What's it going to look like compared to the monument? A big portion of this work um, has been conducted by undergraduates from Colorado Mesa University. So I have to give a shout out to my uh, undergraduates here. They have done really most of the collecting um, and most of the specimen preparation uh, they're the ones who are out in July when it's 100 degrees getting gnats in their eyes. Um, they've really done a fantastic job and, and I'm very proud of, of the work that they've done. Um, in particular, uh, Oriana Rubin in 2014, she spent the whole summer in McInnes Canyon. Um, Jesse Condon in 2016 spent the whole summer in McInnes Canyon. Uh, and then this past summer, Nora Oviat and Grace Gardner uh, worked together, um, kind of vacuuming up hopefully the last species uh, for our species list. So um, much of the work that I'll be taking for <laughs> credit for today uh, was really done by these undergraduates. They've done a fantastic job. So uh, to do this study, we have to be out in the field and we have to be collecting plants, which is a, a really fun thing to do. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our, our kind of methodology, what we did, how we got all the plants. Um, I'll talk about the field first, so actually being outside collecting. And then I'll talk a little bit about the herbarium where we uh, store these plant specimens. So McKinnix Canyon is a big place. Um, and so identifying areas to collect. Um, if you've hiked around in McKinnis Canyon, you also know that sometimes it's hard to get from here to there. Uh, there aren't tons and tons of access points. You've got the Black Ridge Road that leads to some areas up top, uh, the Colorado River, um, Interstate 70, and, and that's about it. So planning on how to get there um, was a big part of, of our study as well. Uh, and then also when to go based on flowering times. So we have some species in the early spring that only bloom for a few weeks, other species that only pop up later in the fall. Uh, the field work is, is quite fun. There is some specialized equipment. Uh, so down in the bottom here, this is a plant press. So it's filled up with sheets of newspaper. Uh, inside those newspaper are plants, and then we cinch down these straps uh, to flatten those plants. So state-of-the-art, super high-tech equipment there. Uh, we take pruning shears to, to cut woody plants, um, a trowel if we need to uh, dig up a plant specimen. Um, and then very importantly are the uh, notebook, marker, and GPS. So for every plant specimen we collect, we take meticulous notes. So as Nora is doing here, uh, we write down the locality where the plant was collected. We write down um, GPS coordinates. We write down what type of habitat it is. Um, a lot of information goes into those notebooks. 
Uh, and then comes the actual collecting and pressing. So for each plant, we photograph the plant. Uh, we document the environment. So we take notes on what kind of habitat it was. Uh, we take notes on um, the plant itself. So things like flower color, um, the height of the plant, any information that won't necessarily be present on the preserved plant specimen. Uh, the GPS information is very important so that we can uh, go back and find uh, the plant or, or that population. Um, and then any other quantit quantitative details uh, about the plant. And then finally, we press the plant. So uh, as Bryn has here, this is just a sheet of newspaper uh, with cardboard. Uh, you open the newspaper, put the plant in there, close the newspaper, and squash it. Once we have the plant collected, uh, we take it back to the herbarium. So all of these pictures are taken um, in the herbarium up at Colorado Mesa University. So uh, the plant has to dry fully. Uh, you can't put any uh, wet plants in the herbarium. They'll mold and, and destroy the collection. So for some plants like succulents, like a cactus, this may take quite a while. Um, for other plants, you know, we're in such a dry environment, other plants may be dry in just a couple of days. We identify the plants using dichotomous keys. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a few examples of these in just a minute. A dichotomous key is essentially a big game of 20 questions. So, you know, they might ask if the plant is woody or herbaceous. And if you say woody, you go to another part of the key. If you say herbaceous, you go to a different part. And so uh, you have these two choice questions and uh, hopefully those will lead you to your plant specimen. Then we do make a, a specimen. So this picture down here shows an herbarium specimen. Uh, so this is a plant glued to a sheet of paper with a label attached to it. And I'll, I'll show you that uh, in a little more detail in just a minute. The label is very important. That gives all of the information about the plant. We have shared all of our specimen information. Uh, it's all available online on a website called intermountainbiota.org. Uh, I'll show you their website in just a minute. And then once all those steps have, have been accomplished, we can uh, file it away in the herbarium as Nora's doing here. Uh, and this is where the plants will live. Well, they're not alive anymore, uh, but this is where the plants will stay forever, essentially. A dried plant specimen can last for hundreds and hundreds of years. So, um, you know, the, the students got to uh, learn and use all of these tools. Uh, the dichotomous key is by far the most difficult because you have to learn all of the terminology associated with plants. Uh, so my students have become experts in that, uh, as well as um, identifying plant species. Just a couple of the, the um, resources that we used. Um, these are some of the, the most useful um, tools for identifying plants. Uh, so the flora of Colorado, this is really the gold standard. Uh, this has all 3,000 or so species of plants that occur in Colorado, uh, written by Jennifer Ackerfield. This is a technical key, uh, so you really have to speak the botanical language to be able to utilize this, uh, but that's, that's really the gold standard. Uh, there are some special resources. Uh, grasses are notoriously difficult. Uh, and so I'm working with my students right now uh, to, to identify the last of our difficult grass specimens. Uh, there is a great online resource. So this is called Southwest Colorado Wildflowers. Oops, sorry, that should be .com. Um, this is a website run by Al Schneider down in Durango. Uh, even though it's a little bit out of our area, it, it pretty much color, covers most of the plants that you'll find in our area as well. Um, there are loads of great pictures on here. Uh, and you can also do searches that are not so technical. Uh, so you can click a few buttons, say, oh, I've got a tree from a riparian area that's flowering in July. Um, and it'll narrow down the plant specimens that fit those characteristics. So particularly for more uh, maybe amateur botanists, this is a really great website to know about. Uh, 
uh, can be really useful for trying to identify plant species that you may see uh, while you're hiking out in McInnes Canyon. So uh, here's what we do a lot of. So uh, a lot of dissecting microscope work uh, using those technical keys like Jennifer Ackerfield's flora here. Um, my students do a lot of gluing plant specimens onto uh, herbarium sheets. And then also a lot of data information to create these plant labels. So here's a zoomed in uh, image of a plant label. Uh, so we have all the information about the family, the identification, where it was found with GPS coordinates, the um, habitat and any other characteristics about the plant, along with the date and the collector. Here's a maybe a prettier specimen. So this is a um, columbine uh, that, was, that was collected in uh, Knowles Canyon. Uh, this columbine has uh, all of the pieces of information. So the plant is obviously very important, but without this label, without all of this information on the label, the plant specimen is really not very useful. So knowing who collected it, when they collected it, where they collected it, all of that information is, is really crucial. So these labels um, help us and, and other scientists uh, know what the plant is, where it is, and when it was collected. This information is all available to the public. So all of our uh, plant collections have been databased on this website, intermountainbiota.org. So this is a great catalog tool. Um, it's helpful for us, it makes labels, and we can also organize our collection records. We can also see anyone else who's collected in McInnes Canyon. And we can use this to create beautiful maps, like some I'll show you in just a minute. Um, and like I said, the public has access to these records. So you can go to this um, website, search collections, and look at plant collections from all over uh, the world, really, from herbaria all over the world. Plus there's a fun plant of the day trivia question every day. So um, this is one of those maps that we created using Intermountain Biota. So um, this is roughly the area of McGinnis Canyon where all of these pins are located. Um, I've included just a little bit of, you know, Fruta and the Colorado Utah border here, uh, just to give a little bit of a frame of reference. But uh, really where the pins are located is McGinnis Canyon. These purple pins show all the collections uh, prior to our study. So there were plant collections known from McInnes Canyon, uh, but as you can probably see, they're, they're clustered in areas like Rabbit Valley that are relatively easy to access, or sites along the Colorado River that are relatively easy to access, or um, places like um, Devil's Canyon area or uh, areas kind of right off the monument like Black Ridge. So there are, were uh, huge swaths of McInnes Canyon that had really not had any botanical collections. So we were able to use this information to guide our collecting efforts. Now, um, spoiler alert here, there are some places that we did not access, right? There, there are some places that are just kind of so far out there um, that it was really difficult even for us to, to access. Um, but I think we did a pretty good job. So if we look at uh, really the first year's collections, um, my students and I were able to fill in some of those gaps, right? Um, some river trips to, to collect in some of these um, more, difficult more difficult to access canyons, um, more collecting in uh, the, the Devil's Canyon area um, over there. 2016 was really a banner year. Uh, so this was my student, uh, Jesse Condon, who just did an absolutely phenomenal job. Um, she got in places that, um, you know, I was, I was frankly amazed um, that, that she was able to do so much collecting. 
So uh, 2016 was really a, a boon year for um, collecting in McGinnis Canyon. Jesse, Jesse did a really phenomenal job then. Uh, most recently in 2020, we uh, filled in even more gaps. Um, 2020 has presented all sorts of challenges, as, as I'm sure all of you are aware. Uh, but we were able to get out there uh, collecting um, in starting in, in May and hopefully, um, like I said, vacuumed up some of the last uh, species that, that we didn't have on our list. As I mentioned, you know, still some areas um, that, that haven't been collected well. Uh, there's always room for future studies out there. Uh, some of these areas just really difficult to get to, but I think we've covered most of the at least habitat types. So, you know, I'd be surprised if there are too many species in some of those areas that, that we haven't seen in other places before. Now, each of those push pins that I just showed you represents a locality. Um, but many of those local localities actually had multiple collections. So you can click on any of those pins in Intermountain Biota, and for many of them, you can see that there are more than one collection. Uh, so for example, on this day, uh, Jessie was walking up a wash. Um, at this site, she made a few collections. Uh, at the next site up the road, she made a couple more, and then uh, another further up. Um, these would probably all show up as one single pin on that previous map I showed you. So even though there are quite a number of pins on that previous map, uh, in reality that, that equals even more collections. Uh, so here's just another example, a slightly different looking map, but the same thing. Uh, my students this summer collected at this locality. Uh, but actually made you know dozens of collections at that single point. So again, I think those points really underrepresent uh, how many collections we've made out in McGinnis Canyon. So um, what are the results? Well, this is what the herbarium looks like after a field season. Um, each of these uh, sheets of newspaper has a plant specimen in it. Um, some of these may be waiting for labels or identification or just waiting to be filed away in the herbarium. Um, so there is, a, there is a method to my cluttering here. Um, but the grand total, uh, the total number of collections for McGinnis Canyon National Conservation Area is 1,258. Um, 711 of those were done by my students which I'm, I'm very proud of. They've done a um, really phenomenal job getting out there. Um, each plant specimen, if you think about the time it takes to collect it and dry it and identify it and make the label and enter that information onto the, the database and file the specimen away, you know, each specimen may take an hour um, from, from start to finish. And so I think this really represents kind of a phenomenal amount of work um, on the part of, of uh, this project. So our grand total as of today is 570 species in McInnes Canyon. We still have some that, um, some specimens that have not been fully identified yet, uh, but, but that's the number we're gonna be working with is 570 species in McInnes Canyons. So um, to, to sort of graphically show this, uh, this is a graph from the, the checklist of plants in the Colorado National Monument. And uh, I, I like this graph because I think what it shows nicely is collection effort. So for the Colorado National Monument, uh, a lot of collection really began in the 1940s. And in these first years of collecting, Essentially, every plant that was collected was a new record for the monument. And so we can see that uh, initially this line goes up pretty steeply. The number of known species in the monument went up quite a bit early on. As people are collecting, everything's a new collection. Oops, sorry, I accidentally clicked something. However, um, you know, as collection efforts really intensified, that, that line shot up even more. So that reflects, I think, that, that great collection effort. 
But then at some point we see diminishing returns, right? There have still been collections happening in the monument since the 90s, uh, but they've resulted in very few new species or at least new for the monument. And so I think what's happened with McInnes Canyon uh, looks a little bit like this. In our first field season, um, every plant we saw was an, essentially a new record for the NCA. Um, in 2016, when, when Jessie was out there uh, mopping up every, every species she could, um, that line shot up very, very steeply. Uh, based on our preliminary evidence from this field season, we're starting to hit this, this flat area. Um, my students spent you know, no less time out in the NCA this summer than in previous years, but essentially we've got representatives of most every species that occurs. And so sure, we can still find um, new representatives out there, uh, but essentially it takes a whole lot longer, right? You know, uh, early on, we may be able to find five or 10 new plants every hour uh, we're hiking around out there. Now we may have to fight, hike five or 10 hours to find a single new um, species. So I think this is really good, even though um, I think my, my two students this summer were, were uh, having a little bit of trouble. Man, we, we, everything we're collecting, we've seen already. Um, I think that's actually a really good thing. That shows that we're getting to this point where um, we know the plant species that are occurring in um, McGinnis Canyon. Will we ever be 100% done? Probably not, uh, but I think we're getting to this point where we, we really have a solid idea of all the plant species that occur out there. So um, I'll show you some of the cool plants that we've found. Um, so actually one of the very first plant species we found in McGinnis Canyon was this astragalus. Uh, it's actually not hard to find. You can go to Dinosaur Hill in the springtime and see this growing all over the place. Uh, but this actually represented a new state record. Uh, no one had ever collected this in Colorado before we found it in um, the NCA back in uh, 2013. So that was kind of a cool uh, way to get started with this project. Uh, we've also found new county records. So uh, many of you probably recognize the species here. This is uh, white clover, um, not an uncommon plant, but this had never been collected in Mesa County before, as it turned out. Um, so uh, by collecting this and making a specimen, we were able to say, hey, no, this definitely occurs uh, in Mesa County. We've got a specimen to prove it. Um, there are some more rare plants. Uh, sorry for the grainy photo here, but this Areogonum, this buckwheat, uh, was another um, new county record for Mesa County. There are some rare plants that occur out in the NCA. So um, Jones Blue Star is a beautiful plant, um, a lovely example. Uh, this is a considered a rare plant in Colorado. It does occur very commonly as you get into Utah, but it kind of just barely makes it into um, Colorado. Uh, this Lomatium and Cryptantha, uh, both of these are also uh, listed as rare plants. And so our information also goes to um, the Colorado Natural Heritage Program that tracks rare plants. Uh, so some of these are new records of new populations of plants that are considered rare in Colorado. So again, we can help out with things like management decisions. Um, in some cases, maybe even say, oh, you know, yeah, this thing is uh, maybe rare in Colorado, but since it's not globally rare, maybe it's of less concern than something that um, is only found in, in Mesa County. Uh, some other plants. So since it was a rainy day, I thought I would just throw in some beautiful plant pictures. Uh, if you've ever hiked out in McInnes Canyon in early spring, you've probably seen this. This uh, bladder pod is one of the very first uh, spring plants to start blooming. So this thing, you can find it in late March uh, or early April blooming out there. Uh, so um, 
our, our field season actually gets going really early um, because, of, because of these early spring plants. Uh, here's a lovely claret cup cactus. Um, so uh, this guy we collected and uh, had to press and dry for, this was about the longest plant I've ever had to dry. This thing stayed in the plant dryer for a couple of months before it was fully dried out. So uh, very well adapted to those harsh conditions out in McGinnis Canyon. Uh, some other lovely, this is a uh, Townsendia or Easter Daisy. Uh, this whole patch was maybe the size of a tea saucer. Uh, so pretty teeny tiny growing right down there on the ground, another early uh, spring, spring plant there. Uh, some are bigger and showier. So uh, this is Tetradymia, the uh, horsebrush. Uh, so this is another um, prolific flower like a lot of our McGinnis Canyon plants, uh, this thing is pretty spiny. Uh, so I probably should have added leather gloves to the list of, of uh, things that we take out in the field. Uh, a lot of these plants are well defended uh, for this harsh des desert environment. A uh, Streptanthus, so this is a, a member of the mustard family, the Brassicaceae, uh, has these really nice big flowering stalks that and stick up a few feet up in the air. Uh, lovely, lovely little uh, spring wildflower as well. You've probably all seen uh, Prince's Plume, Stanleya. Uh, this one I believe was right um, in Devil's Canyon, just, just right when you get out of the parking lot, a nice, nice big patch of them. Uh, one of the things we did have to obviously deal with during our project has been uh, drought years. So this year unfortunately was a little bit dry, uh, up, up until today of course. Um, so certain years you get more prolific blooms, other years um, it's a little more sparse out there. But some really nice uh, wildflowers. Uh, Persia, cliff roses, these can um, well, like as the name implies, these can often right, grow right on the edge, so uh, got to be a little careful collecting these, uh, but these can really light up the whole um, sides of the mesas with their nice yellow flowers in about late May, early June. Penstemon cyanocallis, the blue-stemmed penstemon, really vibrant colors. Uh, the hummingbirds will zip all around the sky uh, and, and dive in there. So beautiful wildflower again. Uh, Ipomopsis congesta, the ball head Ipomopsis. Uh, this thing is, this was probably about three feet in diameter, this clump of it, uh, just growing like crazy right out in uh, Devil's Canyon again. Um, it even seems to be fending off the cheek grass here. You can see a couple couple sprigs of cheatgrass growing out of it, but nice, nice healthy uh, Ipomopsis. I love the little blue anthers you can see in the flower, uh, just these teeny blue anthers. Enothera pallida, the primroses are always lovely. Um, I, I always try to convince my students in the springtime to go out in the evenings when the hawk moths come to visit these, the sphinx moths will um, soar down and, and drink the nectar out of these. They have a long tube that contains the nectar and the hawk moths are just about the only thing with a tongue that's long enough uh, to dip down in there. There are a few special habitats in the NCA and so they're an, a, a very occasional, uh, but they harbor some really interesting plant life. Uh, so this is Star Solomon's seal. Uh, usually this thing occurs in places like, you know, creek sides on the mesa, places like that. Uh, but in these wet, seepy environments, you can even find them in McGinnis Canyon. Uh, you know, you can see the, the mosses growing on the side of the um, sandstone there. This patch of Solomon's seal, it's really dense, but it's only right there. Uh, so, you know, you can be 50 feet away and not see a single one. So finding these special habitats like these seeps was really important to us because we could document a lot of the diversity that occurs 
uh, you know, you can spend endless hours in the pinion juniper and never see this plant, but if you get into a seep, uh, there it is. Those seeps also have things like this um, columbine. So this is the alcove columbine, uh, Aquilegia micrantha, uh, beautiful flowers, but again, very restricted in its distribution within the NCA, only find it in, in a few seeps. Uh, you can even find things like sedges and rushes. Uh, so these are grass-like plants that really need water. These, these are, are riparian plants. Um, they have to be in, in wet areas, but you get in the right habitat and you can even find these in the NCA. So uh, throughout a lot of our wanderings there, we've been you know, looking for these special habitats so that we can document the, the special um, species that only occur there. You can even have aquatic plants like this buttercup. So this is the alkali buttercup. Uh, you can see the, the running water, not very common out there in the NCA, but where you find it, you get special plant species. So um, these are slightly old numbers. I haven't included the 2020 field season yet, um, but we can, start to compare McInnes Canyon and the Colorado National Monument. So um, this is a, a nice Venn diagram. I don't get to use Venn diagrams very much, so this is kind of fun. Uh, what this shows is that almost 300 species are found in both McInnes Canyon and the Colorado National Monument. You know, we'd expect a lot of overlap between those two areas. They share a border, they share similar habitat. I think what's a little more surprising is the numbers of species that are unique to McInnes Canyon and the Colorado National Monument. So uh, 150 species, about 150 species are only found in McInnes Canyon. Um, about 221 seem unique to the Colorado National Monument, so not shared between these two. So, um, Again, take this with a little bit of a grain of salt because this is um, a little bit out of date. This is based on um, the, the 26 field season data. Um, but I think what this shows is some interesting things, right? We'll see if these numbers hold up, right? I would have expected the, the number of shared species to be a little bit higher. But I think it's really interesting that there are all of these unique species. So if this holds up, I think this makes a great case for um, you know, paying extra attention to these unique species. Um, this certainly um, supports the idea that we need lots of conserved land if there are these unique areas or, or plants that are unique to these given areas. So again, um, I, I'm, I'm excited to see um, once we add in our 2020 field season data, um, I haven't quite gotten there yet, but um, I'm excited to see what um, our data will show um, based, on, based on the more recent collections. Um, so with that, I'd like to give thanks to um, all of my CMU students that have worked countless hours um, as Bureau of Land Management or the Sakamoto Institute interns. Um, they really uh, have, have done the grunt work here in terms of being out there in the, in the canyons when it's <laughs> maybe a little warmer uh, than, than they would want it to be. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management and Sakamano Higher Education Foundation for their financial support to, to get this project going, uh, to help train these students and uh, to produce this checklist of plants. Uh, the Grand Junction BLM field office has been uh, particularly helpful. Uh, Nikki Grant Hoffman has done uh, just a, an amazing job, been really helpful. Um, so harboring those or, or fostering those relationships between places like CMU and the Bureau of Land Management has been um, an extra bonus um, aspect of this project. So um, with that, I'll, I'll open it up to any questions, leave you with another pretty plant picture on this uh, slightly dreary <laughs> evening. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have, and thanks for your attention. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, I know I learned a ton during that. 
Um, like Stephen said, enter any questions into the Q&A box. It looks like we have one question right now. Um, Jim and Teresa are asking if there's any grazing in the NCA, cattle, sheep, etc. Yeah, so so there is. Um, so up on um, particularly Black Ridge area, you can see definitely um, signs of grazing up there. So um, that is one thing that the, the BLM does manage. Um, I think, you know, kind of getting back to that, that point of multiple uses, um, I, I, I don't necessarily always envy my BLM colleagues because of all the different um, people they have to please, right? And so, you know, there, there are these multiple uses. Uh, you know, I'm a biologist, but I also mountain bike and I love going out to the Cocopelli area. Um, you know, I know that motorized use like dirt bikes are allowed out in Rabbit Valley, um, especially, especially this summer. I don't know if any of you got out to Rabbit Valley, but um, there were so many people camping out there and, and enjoying the public lands. Um, but that obviously takes its, its toll as well. So I know the BLM has been um, looking at, at camping and, and trying to regulate that a little more carefully in places like Rabbit Valley. So I think what's kind of cool about uh, McInnes Canyon in particular is, is that there are these different areas for different things for different uses. Um, it's certainly a juggling act for the Bureau of Land Management, um, but, but yeah, there, there are um, those different uses out there. All right, so we have another question from Elizabeth. She's saying, how high is the proportion of non-native species? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So I haven't broken down the data in that way yet. Um, so, so that's certainly something um, that I'll be interested to look at. You know, it's, yeah, it's gonna be really interesting. I know if you, if you go out there um, and in certain areas, it seems like every plant you see is an invasive. You know, there are certain areas that have been heavily impacted by things like cheatgrass. Um, but other areas are, are pretty resilient and you really don't see that many um, invasive species. And so um, I, I know that's talking about sort of proportions and, and not actual numbers. Um, I'll, be, I'll be interested to, to look at the data. That, that wouldn't be too hard to, to do. Um, I'm happy to, uh, if, you, if you send me an email, uh, my email is s stern s-t-e-r-n at colorado mesa dot edu um, i'm happy to to answer any of those that i can't right now um, and, and dig into that a little bit deeper but yeah great question all right we have one from susan that says how do your students know if a plant has been collected before or not yeah that's that's a great question too and, it, and it's been pretty um tricky so um, I, I really have to kind of select the, the best of the best students. Uh, as you can probably imagine, IDing the plants is, is probably the biggest skill that my students um, learn from this. And, and I try to get students who already know uh, a pretty good deal of plant identification. So um, within, a, within a year when my interns are working out there, they get, I think, a good um, feel for what they've collected and what they haven't. Um, when we start a field season, I'll go out with the students a, a bit more and say, okay, you know, we don't need to collect pinion and juniper, we've got those already. Um, there is a lot of, of recollection of things and, and that's good, right? I, I think that's part of it. Um, some plants, you know, you really have to get under a microscope to be able to identify fully and so we certainly recollect things as well. Um, I think that data is still very useful, um, but it is definitely more exciting when you get something that we haven't gotten before. So my students this summer, since they um, joined the project late in the, in the life cycle of the project, uh, they got a lot of duplicates, uh, things that we'd already collected, but um, they learned pretty quick what, to, what, what we have, what we don't have. So we, we keep a running list with us too that we take out in the field that we can flip through pretty quickly. 
All right, we have a question from Grant and he's asking, do you have a sense of what are the main reasons for the large number of non-overlapping species between the NCA and the monument? You know, I, I really want to dive into that more um, because I, I find that fascinating. So there are a few possibilities. Um, first of all, I think, you know, we, we don't have all of our data in there yet. So, so that's, that's sort of the first disclaimer. I think the number of shared species will go up. Um, the unique species, though, are interesting. Um, I know that there are certain, uh, for, for example, the, the monument is a little seepier. So there are more seeps there. I know that there are some species that occur in those seeps that uh, are in the monument that aren't in McInnes Canyon because it simply doesn't have uh, the number of seeps present. So that water really, really helps the monument, I think, in terms of diversity. Um, the monument also seems to have a few just little niches, special types of, um, you know, not even necessarily a seep, but shady overhung areas where you just seem to get a slightly different mix of species. In particular, um, a few kind of high elevation plants just barely make their way into the monument. So even though Black Ridge is higher, um, the monument seems to have just some, a few special nooks and crannies. Um, McInnes Canyon has the river, which I think could, could add a few species there, uh, but it doesn't seem to be as species diverse as one might expect. So uh, the river certainly adds species, but, but not maybe quite as many as we'd expect. But I, I'm with you. I think that's really interesting, and I'm, I'm excited to, to dive into that a little bit more. And, really get the lists next to each other and, and see um, which plants are, are lacking in each of the two areas. All right, we have one from Jesse asking, what is the most exciting thing that you have found in your study so far? <laughs> oh, the most exciting thing. They're all exciting. It's, it's, <laughs> it's like trying to pick your favorite child. I have a favorite child too, but... Um, yeah, I, the most exciting event that happened to us, we were, we were hiking up um, a, a canyon, trying to see if there was a seep at the top of a canyon. And I don't know if it was big horns or what, but um, we, there was a nice little rock fall that came down about 20, 30 feet from us that um, one, of, one of my interns uh, was, was kind of done at that point. So almost getting crushed by rocks is definitely a pretty exciting event out there. Um, in terms of the species, I mean, honestly, I, I just love, I love being out there in the springtime. That, that's really what gets me the most excited. And, um, you know, hiking in, in fields of sago lilies, there's not much that beats that. Well, this will force you to pick a favorite again, but Kaylin, Kaylin is asking, what is your favorite plant and why? Oh um, my, wow. There, you know, <laughs> there are three, 400,000 plant species on earth. That's a tough one. Um, I think so. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. So before I, before I came to Colorado, I studied um, a plant group called Solanum, which includes the tomato eggplant um, and potato. And so there's a cool little plant called Selenum rostratum, um, and it's a pokey, spiny, nasty little plant. Um, and it's actually one of my favorites. It's, it's got a really cool flower um, where one of the anthers that makes the pollen is slightly different. And so when a bee lands on the flower, it grabs pollen and it eats the pollen, which is bad for the plant. But the plant actually outsmarts it by putting pollen on the bee's backside where it can't reach it. And so uh, that's one of my favorite plants, just plants outsmarting animals, I think is very fun. Great, so we'll take maybe one or two more questions. Um, Sally is asking what permits uh, you need for collecting. Yeah, so all the permits um, come through the Bureau of Land Management. And so, yeah, I definitely, um, you need to have um, permits and documentation to be able to go out there. Um, so uh, 
my colleagues at the Bureau of Land Management, you know, worked with me to get all of those set up. Uh, it's actually a nice big, thick uh, collection agreement that I carry out there every day with me, just in case anybody says, hey, what are you doing? Say, no, no, it's, it's okay. I'm a botanist. I'm, I'm good to go. Um, but yeah, there, there are permits through the Bureau of Land Management. Awesome. Well, we also have some requests for you to maybe lead a hike in McKinnis Canyons uh, in a non-COVID year. So. <laughs> I would love to. Yeah, I think that would be a lot of fun. So. Awesome. Well, if you have any more questions, um, I'm sure you could email Stephen. Uh, he provided his email address if you want to give that one more time, Stephen, or um, type yeah, it in the chat box. Uh, if I can find the, I don't, I don't see my chat box. Hmm. Oh, here's the chat. Yeah, so I'll type it in. So it's stern at Colorado Mesa edu. So you're welcome to, um, yeah, shoot shoot any emails, um, email me with any questions. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being here. Um, yeah. Like I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is a whole lecture series. So we have three more lectures to follow after this. Our next one will be on September 22nd with um, Dr. Julia McHugh, who is a paleontologist at the Dinosaur Journey Museum, and she'll be discussing some of her recent research in McKinnis Canyons. After that, on October 6th, we'll be um, speaking with Dr. Parna Palmer, also a CMU professor, and she'll be talking about uh, the water bears or tardigrades, a really cool species that um, have been found in some of the canyons. And then lastly, um, we'll have Dr. Nikki Grant Hoffman presenting on some fire restoration treatments that she's been doing in McKinnis Canyons as well. Uh, if you wanna learn more about Colorado Canyons Association, you can visit our website at coloradocanyonsassociation.org. You'll find a bunch of information about our programs, uh, more community events to get involved in and uh, ways you can support our, our organization. And uh, feel free to reach out to me personally as well. Um, so thank you everyone for being here and we will look forward to seeing you at the next lecture. Thanks. Yeah, thanks Stephen, bye. bye.